All right, welcome back to the cloudchurch.org. I'm Robert Breaker, Missionary Evangelist of the Spanish and English speaking people. And we have been doing our best here every week to put up a new sermon in English and Spanish. And um, we've also had some lighting issues and some lighting problems. I'm trying to, to do a good recording here to present this uh, to people and get this out. And sometimes it turns out good, sometimes it doesn't. But we do the best we can. So please keep us in prayer as we attempt to try to get the gospel to the lost and try to get those who are saved good information, good doctrine, good teaching. You've got your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6. And also we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. So 1 Samuel 2, 6 and Hebrews 9, 27. We are around the Pensacola and Milton area. I know there's a lot of churches around there. And... Um, we don't want to steal anyone from their home church. But if you are looking for a church or want to start one in your home and you live close to that area, let us know. We've been looking for a place where we could meet. We have several families that would like to join us and would like to actually record this live every week as we meet together. Maybe God will start a, a church through all this. We'll see. But uh, in the meantime, we're just recording here in a little tiny office. Uh, every now and then someone will stop by and want to sit in and listen but there are very, very little room here. And one thing we are starving for is fellowship. We want to see people with the truth. It's very hard to find a good Bible-believing church nowadays, and even harder to find one that will go verse by verse through the Scriptures and teach verse by verse. And if you haven't looked at it yet, please go to our um, the cloudchurch.org um, verse by verse Bible study as we're going verse by verse through the books of the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written. We just finished up 1 Thessalonians. We're about to start 2 Thessalonians as we go verse by verse from the Scriptures. And once again, if you have a home church, do not leave your home church. We don't want to steal anyone from their home church. That is not the, the reason that this has been started. This is the cloudchurch.org, and it was started to help people that are sick or elderly or for whatever reason don't have a home church or can't leave the house. But we also try to be an encouragement to pastors, to Sunday school teachers, to take this information as well. We want to be help, and we want to build up churches that are already established. We just want people to see the truth of the gospel and then learn the doctrines uh, the pure doctrine of the Bible and preach that as well. But if you don't have a home church, you can't find one, like I said, you're close to this area uh, and you want to meet in a home, let us know. We'd love to start recording in a house and having people present and having fellowship. That'd be a blessing. So leave that on the back burner. Think about that. Maybe you're in South of Alabama or someplace. I've run into several men lately that uh, they go house to house and preach the Bible. And they do it every week or every two weeks. I know one man in particular, he has four different places that he goes during the week. And um, he preaches like Alabama and Florida. I think he might even go to Georgia. And we are living in the last days of apostasy. And it's sad. It's really sad, the apostasy we see nowadays. And it's very hard to find someone that's a good Bible teacher that will tell you what the King James Bible says without trying to correct it. And um, this man I'm talking about, he travels around. And you know, in the Bible... Churches were men houses. They met in houses. Why was that? Well, because it was a time period when they persecuted the church. And so they had to meet in secret, underground, if you will. Well, here we are at the end of the church age, and we're starting to see worldwide persecution of churches. And it just might get to that point again where we need to get back to how the church started. We might just need to start. I've heard people say, house churches, oh, they're evil. I've heard guys on YouTube talk about house church is wrong. I don't understand when it's in the scriptures. As long as your fellowship is based on the King James Bible and doing right and living right and teaching pure doctrine, there's nothing wrong with it. So just something to think about. If you would, please pray for us. We enjoy hearing from you. Please um, email us. Let us know some prayer requests and we'll pray for you as well. Well, thank you for joining the Cloud Church. And let's, give, let's begin this morning with where do the dead go? 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 6 says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave. And bring it up. So the Lord is the creator of man. He also kills man when men do wrong, but he also brings them alive, makes them alive. He, the Bible says here, he bringeth down to the grave, and God can bring up from the grave. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. Hebrews 9 27 says this And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 
So these verses here speak about dying. Where do the dead go? Well, why do we die? Is that, have you ever thought about that? Evolution gives no answer whatsoever. The theory of evolution said everything just evolved over time from absolutely nothing. Well, then why does it die? If we've been here for billions of years, like evolutionists teach, why hasn't something evolved that doesn't die? Why is there death? Where does that come from? There's no answer. And it doesn't make sense because all the science fiction based upon, um, based upon evolution has man evolving into a being that becomes like light or something, some kind of a being that's eternal that can never die. So how can evolution bring you to a point where you never die when all, if evolution is true, you see is death and dying? Evolution is actually survival of the fittest, which means the more fit kills, the less fit. So where does dying come into place? Why do we die? Well, only the Bible has the answer. And once again, evolution falls short. And in the Bible, we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and we read the account of why we die. We find that God created man, but man sinned against God. And because of that, man died. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was the one man? The man that God created, Adam. By one man sin entered into by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So why do we die? We die because of sin. It's all because of sin. Now, what happened? Let's go to Genesis chapter two, and I'll just go through this quickly to try to set up what I want to get to is where do we go when we die, but it's always good to know why we die. Why do we die? Because of sin. You know, oddly enough, in evolution, there's no such thing as sin. Survival of the fittest. Kill whoever you want to kill. Do whatever you want to do. As long as you're the bigger one and the higher up on the food chain, there's no sin. It's not wrong. Well, according to the Bible, there is right and there is wrong. So, thank God for the Bible. At least in the Bible, we have morals. When you go to evolution, it's immoral. Evolution said you came from animals, and what does it teach? It teaches you, just go ahead and live like one. And that's how evolutionists live. They live like a bunch of animals. Well, thankfully, we have a Bible that says we're a creation made of God. And it tells us to try to live holy, try to please God, try to do right. And that's a good way to live. Now, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou that mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we die because of sin. And what happened? Adam ate, and he died. And so, <laughs> that's, that's just the way it ended up. So let's go to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And let's look at what man is, how God made man, why God made man, and then we'll look about where a man goes when he dies. Because we've got to see what it is that actually goes somewhere when you die. There is a difference between a body and a soul. And we need to get that in order to get this teaching and understanding. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. I know it sounds like I'm jumping around a bit, but we will get to this. Um, and we'll put it all in order so we can see where exactly do the dead go when they die. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. The Bible says... And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us there's three parts to a man. And the three parts of man are his body, his soul, and his spirit. There are three parts. Now, I know there's some denominations and religions that say, oh, man's just a dichotomy. That means he just has two parts. And they believe that a man is just a body and a spirit or maybe a body and a soul. But according to the Bible, there's three parts to man. And we see these three parts all throughout the Bible, and in Greek, there are actually three different words. The word for body is pasuke. Pasuke, that's kind of where we get the word psyche uh, in English, pasuke. The word soul is soma, and the word spirit is pneuma, like pneumatos, or pneumonia. It has to do with air, pneuma. Now in Hebrew, the word for body is nefesh, nefesh. The word for soul is uh, bashar, bashar. And the word for spirit is 
Ruach. Ruach. So what we have is three very different distinct parts of a man. It's not just in English, it's in every language. A man is made up of a body, of a soul, and a spirit. So here's what a man looks like according to the Bible. He has this outward thing that we see called a body. Inside that body, he has a soul. Same shape as his body as we will see eventually. So here's the body on the outside. Now when a man dies, it's the body that dies. The inside is his soul, and that soul is something that lasts forever. It will last forever. It is an eternal thing that is you that was last forever. And it will go to one of two places, which we will see in a minute. Inside his body, this inside, is the spirit. I'm about to write it in Spanish, my bad. Spirit. I just finished preaching in Spanish. And the spirit is what's inside. And when a person is born, he's born spiritually dead because of Adam. When God said, the day that thou eat thou of, thou shalt surely die, Adam died spiritually. So he's born without a spirit. So every person born into this world is born, see there's three different things here. He's born with these two, and this one is dead. It's empty. So he's two-thirds of a man. He's not complete. You know what two-thirds is in fractional form? Point six, six, six. What are the odds of that? Point six, six, six. You say, well, I don't know why, but I don't like that number. That's a bad number. Why is six, six, six a bad number? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 tells us why. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So six, six, six is the number of man. Why is it man's number? Because man is not complete. He has a dead spirit. He's two-thirds of what he should be, so he's point six six six. Now, in the future, we see a man called the man of sin, which is also the Antichrist, and he will use this number. So, man was made by God. But the Bible says God created man in his own image. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Now, we've got to see all this before we can get to where the dead go, so we'll see exactly what goes where when you're dead. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, notice what God says speaking to himself. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. How odd that God is talking, and God says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Us and our and our, that's plural. Why is God referring to himself in the plural? Well, because the Bible says there in verse 27, I had it here, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he him. You see, God is a trinity. He is a triune God. That means he's one God with three parts. You see, I'm one person. If this were me, this is me, this is Robert. I'm one Robert, but I'm made up of three parts. One of them, when I was born, was dead, but now I have the Holy Spirit inside. So, what is God, okay? Well, here's the Trinity. And I'll probably have to erase some of this in a minute to write some other things up here. But the best way to explain God is like this. Here's God. He's one God, but he's made up of three parts. God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Now notice the Holy Spirit is not the Son. You see that line there? The Son is not the Father. See that line? The Father is not the Holy Spirit. See the line? But the Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is Son. Now God can divide himself up in, three, in those three parts. We can't. But God is one God with three parts. And he said, I'll make man in my image. And now man has three parts. He's a body. He's a soul. And a spirit. And man sinned. And when he sinned, he fell. He lost the spirit of God that was inside of him. So now he's just a body and a soul. So when you die, what happens? When you die, it's the body that dies. And that soul is still left, and it's going to spin somewhere forever. Where is it going to go? Let's see that. Let's see what death is. Death is, as Shakespeare used to call it, shuffling off this mortal coil. I believe that's in Hamlet. It's the body dies, it comes off. 
and then the soul comes out and goes to one of two places. Let's look at that. This is for all the Jehovah Witnesses out there. The Jehovah Witnesses have something in common with evolution. They believe when you die, that's it. You don't exist anymore. They believe the soul is annihilated or annihilated or whatever that word is they use, and that the soul doesn't go anywhere. It's just the end of you, really. Well, let's look at what the Bible says about that. In Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, we read, And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, and then it says, parentheses, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, and her father called him Benjamin. So, her soul was in departing. Here it is talking about someone, one of Jacob's wives, and it says that she died. In the verse 19, and Rachel died. So it's Rachel that it's talking about. So when you die, what happens? When you die, your soul comes out. And so basically, let's see if I've got enough room up here to write everything. I'll try. hope this will show up here. Here we have a person who's alive. Well, that live person, when he dies, what happens to him? When he dies, his body goes down here in the grave. And his body is down here. But where does his soul go? Well, the soul can go to one of two places. Either the soul goes up to here to heaven, or the soul goes down here to the place of flames called hell. Let's see, is that too low? Yep, you can still see that. So there's one of two places that a person can go. Either number one to heaven or number two to hell. According to the Bible, where do the dead go? Either to heaven or to hell. What does the Bible say about that? Well, let's look at hell. What is hell? Well, first, look at Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. And Psalms 9, 17 tells us about this. Now, this ought to scare you. If you're not saved, if you're an evolutionist, if you're a Jehovah Witness, you should be scared about this. Because why would you want to go to hell? Why would you want to take a chance? You say, I don't believe in that. Why even take a chance? I just showed you God said it is here. God said it's true. Whether you believe it or not, that's where your soul's going if you're not saved. So why even take a chance? Why not come to God and trust Him as your Savior? Psalms chapter 9, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So where do the wicked go when they die? People that aren't saved, the lost, they go down here to hell. What is hell? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 32 tells us it's a place of God's wrath. And there's many other verses in the Bible, and we'll look at a couple in a minute. It tells us that it's a place of burning brimstone and fire, a place of torture and torment. Psalm 32, 22 says, for a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell. God is speaking. And shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So, God says, a fire is kindled in his anger. What is hell? It's the place where God pours out his wrath on a sinner who rejects him. Because you see, God can't let someone who's a sinner into heaven. So there's no other place to put them. The only other place is hell. Now, there's no purgatory, as a certain gigantic religion tries to say, centered in Rome. The Bible, the King James Bible, never mentions purgatory. You don't go here for a little while, and eventually, when you pay enough, you get out. Jesus says that this place is forever. The only time someone will ever get out of hell is so that they can go to the judgment and be thrown into the lake of fire. And we'll look at that in a minute. So... Here's what the Bible teaches. Where do the dead go? Where do the dead go? What is it talking about? All right, we looked at what you are. A human being is three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Now, a person who comes to Jesus Christ for salvation to be saved, the Bible says they receive the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit comes inside of them and dwells in them. So when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says you become a new creature, and the soul and the spirit are welded and melded together and become the new creature. So that's the new creature. And the Bible says to reckon the body dead, reckon the flesh dead. And you're waiting for the rapture, according to the Bible, and at the rapture you'll get a new body, a glorified body. So, where do the dead go? Well, if you're saved dead, you're going to go to heaven. Because the spirit inside of you is what will take you up when you die. Some of you have probably seen that old movie, I only mention it because I saw it years ago, Ghost. 
And in that movie, Ghost, what happens to the bad guy when he dies? Well, all these demons come and start grabbing him, and what do they do? They just pull him and suck him down into hell. I don't think they need demons to do that. There's a thing called gravity. And if you don't have something to help you, that when you die and you're lost, that, that soul will automatically just start sinking down. That's why you need salvation. You need something to take you up. What is the Holy Spirit like? Well, it's like wind. Jesus said, the wind bloweth where it listed. You must be born again. When you're born again, you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, and it, like helium, lifts you up. It takes you to heaven when you die. So only one of two places do the dead go to, heaven or hell. Now, there's some interesting things that we'll need to learn. Let's see if I can write this up here. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to make sure I present this clearly. Well, let me, I hate to erase what I've already drawn. I'll just draw it over here, I guess. Here we're going to look at, in the Old Testament, there was a little bit different. And then at the cross, when Jesus died, things changed. So in the Old Testament, when someone died, he went to a different place than people go today. This heaven that's up here, in the Old Testament, was called Abraham's bosom. And we're going to look at the verses of this. And in Abraham's bosom is where the people in the Old Testament who did right and lived right went to. Now the Bible says in between Abraham's bosom and hell, there was a place called the gulf. And there was a great gulf betwixt Abraham's bosom and hell. And the Bible calls Abraham's bosom paradise. Now we're not Muslims. We don't believe in what they call paradise. Because in heaven there's no uh, virgins that you can fornicate with for all eternity. You don't get 49 virgins or 70 or however many there are. In heaven there's n neither marrying or giving in marriage, the Bible says. So let's go to Luke chapter 23. In verse 43. Here we have Jesus Christ on the cross. See, uh, this is an interesting uh, sermon. I was talking to a, a friend not too long ago about where's Abraham's bosom? Where's paradise? Hope he watches this because this will be a good, a good teaching to help him to see exactly where it is. But in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, it says, Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. That was 34. Now let me read 43, the right one, what I tried to get to. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross, we're told that there were two people that died next to him. One of them was a good one, and one of them was a bad one. Now they're both sinners, but I say a good one because he repented, and he believed upon Jesus. And then Jesus said, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Well, where did he go? Well, paradise at that time was down here, and we're going to prove that. We're going to show you that. But later, paradise came up here, and paradise today is in heaven, and we'll show you that as well. So it was a little bit different before the cross how things were. So let's go to Luke chapter 16, and let me state dogmatically that what I'm about to read is not a parable. There have been many people who have tried to teach this as only a parable. But when Jesus tells you what a parable is, he says, this is a parable. He usually says, behold, I tell you a parable. Nowhere in this passage is this a parable. This is an account of something that literally happened in the time of Jesus or possibly way before. But Jesus is telling a true account, a true story here. And he tells us a story of two people that died. One who died that was a good person who ended up going to here, to paradise, or Abraham's bosom, and another person who was a bad person, who died, and they went down here. The Bible calls him the rich man. The rich man went to hell. The poor man came over here to, oops, put him in the wrong place. And the poor man went over here to Abraham's bosom. And let's look at that. Luke chapter 16, it's a little lengthy, but we've got to read it all so we can see what it's talking about. So Luke 16 and verse 19. A great preaching text, by the way, on hell. In verse 19, there was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which were, fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. 
So this poor man was, in the Old Testament sense, I guess you could say he was saved. And when he died, what happened? What left? His soul was carried to Abraham's bosom. So when he died, he came here to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and was buried. So the rich man's body was buried. But look what it says. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. What was in hell? His soul. So the rich man's soul is in hell. One died and went over here to safety. The other died and went over here to hell. And it says, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Three times in this passage it tells us that hell is a place of torment. Verse 23, being in torment. Verse 24, he said, I am tormented in this flame. In verse 28, he says, this place of torment. So hell is not a good place. It's not a party. It's not where you're going to go down and have a good time. A lot of Satanists think, oh, I'll serve Satan and I'll go to the big party in hell. That's not a party. It's third degree burns. It's flame. It's fire. It's brimstone. It's the smokestacks of a devil's hell where your soul will burn like a sausage on a frying pan for all eternity. And you just have torment and pain and anguish. Years ago, I still don't know if this was true or not, but years ago they say that a, a man drilled down 10, 11, 12 miles under the earth and put a microphone down into the earth and what he recorded was the sounds of hell. And I don't know if that's been debunked or not, if that's really true. But you used to could get a videotape of that and you could hear screamings and yellings and people crying and talking in all different languages. Now that could have been completely made up or maybe it was real. I still don't know. But I've heard that tape and I tell you what, it, it makes the hairs in the back of your neck stand up. It gives you goosebumps. Whether it's real or not, there is a real place called hell according to the Bible, where people are right now. And they're screaming, and they're crying, and they're burning in torment and flames. And they're crying out to God, saying, I'm sorry, but it's too late. You see, after you die, it's too late. You can't accept Jesus as your Savior. So in hell, verse 23, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So we call it Abraham's bosom, the place where those who, were, who did right during their life go. And the Bible says, we're going to read it, there's a gulf between them. <laughs> and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. People in hell want ice water, and they'll never get it. This guy even asked just for one little drop of water on the tip of your tank, finger, and he didn't get it. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy life time receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now is he comforted and thou art tormented four times I said tormented three times there's another time it says tormented so four times we see the word tormented verse 26 and besides all this between us and you there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that we could come from thence so before Jesus died on the cross this is where the dead went when they died they went to hell those that weren't um, followers of, of God. And yet those who were, they came over here, and the Bible tells us there was a great gulf, and they could see each other. The people on this side could look over and see them, and the people on this side could look over and see them, and they could recognize each other. And they could scream and yell across and say, hey, I'm this, oh yeah, well, I'm that. And then it says in verse 27, Then he said, the rich man, I pray therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. My last message on the Cloud Church last week was my testimony of how I got saved. Sadly, it was a very poor quality video. I wasn't able to get the lighting correct. But look, he says, I want them to testify. If you're saved, you need to testify. You need to give your testimony of salvation. You need to tell people how to get saved. Because if you don't, and they don't get saved, that's where they go for all eternity. And God does not want them to go down here to hell. That's why it's up to us to preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he says that he may testify unto them, lest they come unto this place of torment. 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And you know what's funny? 
Verse 25 says there's Lazarus is down there. Well, actually, Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry raised from the dead a man named Lazarus. It was probably not the same Lazarus. It was probably another Lazarus. But Jesus Christ rose Lazarus from the dead after four days. Interesting. And he came back from the dead. But you know, very seldom have anyone in this earth come back from the dead. There was about six other times in the Old Testament when Jesus Christ brought someone from the dead. In the New Testament, the apostles once or twice raised someone from the dead. Jesus Christ, because he was God manifest in the flesh, raised from the dead by his own power, the Bible says. But you can't do it. You won't be able to raise from the dead. When you die, your soul goes to there or to there. And it's all based upon what you do with Jesus Christ. So, next thing we do is we come to uh, verse 30. And he says, They will repent. And listen to what Father Abraham said. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And you know what? One rose from the dead. The name was Lazarus. Didn't persuade the Pharisees. They wanted to kill him, the Bible says. So this is a passage of Scripture that I believe really, really happened. It's not a parable. And it shows us where the dead went before Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, remember, Abraham's bosom is also called paradise. Yep, you can see that. Paradise. So, what happened after Jesus Christ died from the dead? And where do people go now? Well, let's look at that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Where is paradise? Well, paradise was in the heart of the earth. And we see that because of Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 and 40. Jesus says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, which is Jonah. And in verse 40, God says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights, where? In the heart of the earth. When Jesus Christ died, his body went into the grave for three days and three nights. His soul went to the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So where was paradise? Well, it must have been in the heart of the earth. Just as we read in Luke 16, it must have been this set up where hell's on one side, a great gulf in the middle, and Abraham's bosom or paradise on this side. And Jesus said to that dying thief, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. So where did he go? The heart of the earth. So he went to paradise, the heart of the earth. Now, when Jesus Christ died, something very strange happened. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51 and 53. You see, these people down here in Abraham's bosom, they were held captive. And they were there waiting for the Messiah to come and preach to them. You see, they weren't redeemed. They had their sins remitted, but the sins of the whole world hadn't been paid for yet. So they couldn't go to heaven because they didn't have their sins completely taken out. That didn't happen until the cross. After the cross, that's when they were able to go up here with Jesus Christ. And we'll read that in a minute about how he took captivity captive. So Matthew chapter 27 verse 51, probably one of the strangest passages in the entire Bible, with the exception of the one in Revelation that talks about for five months people will try to die and they can't die. It almost sounds like zombies. Well check this out, Matthew 27 verse 51 through 53. And beheld the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Now let's look at the context, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So Jesus Christ is right here on the cross, and he dies on the cross. And what happens? 51, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, excuse me, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. What? This verse says Jesus is on the cross. And then it says, but after uh, the resurrection, or after Jesus rose again, after three days and three nights, many of the saints which slept arose. So their souls came out of here into their bodies, and they got up and started walking around. There's only three verses that talk about that, and that's it. I sure wish I had known. Who are they? What were they doing? What did the people think? I, mean, I have so many questions, but the Bible tells us that happened. What happened then? They were all taken up to heaven. And we will prove that from the scriptures. 
And um, so let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You say, this is odd. I don't, I don't know if I can believe all that. Well, you can believe what you want. This is just what the Bible teaches. And if you don't believe it, someday you'll find out. Matter of fact, as soon as you die, you'll find out. Because you'll either wake up right there, or you'll wake up down there. And when you wake up down in hell, if you're not saved, then you'll say, yep, yep, that was right. That was right. So it's better to believe it now and get saved so you can go to heaven and not have to go to hell. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible says, Wherefore he saith, when he sended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now it's talking about Jesus Christ. Now that he ascended, what is it but also that he had ascended first into the lower parts of the earth? Jesus Christ, when he died, was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The lower parts of the earth. He that descended up is the same also that ascended up far above all things, that he might fill all things. So this far verse is talking about Jesus Christ when he went down to the heart of the earth. He led captivity captive. There were some captives down here that he took up with him. Where did he take them to? To heaven. So these were the people in Abraham's bosom, or paradise, that God allowed to be raised from the dead here, and he took them with him up to heaven. This down here was called paradise, and we will get to it in a minute, and we will see that this is now called paradise. This is now in heaven. And we will see that in a minute. There's so many verses. Go to Romans chapter 10. He led captivity captive. Romans chapter 10 and verse 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? So, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from the above? Where is Jesus Christ now? He's in heaven. So when he took captivity captive and he ascended, where did he ascend to? He ascended to heaven. And it said, but before he descended into the deep, he went down to the deep of the earth, the heart of the earth. Now let's go to uh, Isaiah 55, 14. Isaiah chapter 5 and 14, when Jesus Christ died, get this, he went down three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then he brought up from the earth those people that were captives in Abraham's bosom. And this is what took place at that time. 5.14 Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So hell hath enlarged herself. What is this verse talking about? Well, now... Since this is empty, because all these people were taken out, hell enlarged itself. So in the center of the earth, all this is hell. There's no more gulf. Hell hath enlarged itself. And more and more people who die that are lost, they drop off into hell. The wicked shall be cast into hell. And all those that forget God. So this, this guy over here went to Abraham's bosom. But when Jesus rose again from the dead, all these people went up to paradise in heaven. And paradise is no more down here. Paradise is now up here. How do we know that? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is speaking. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul tells us something happened to him one day. I'm in 1 Corinthians, excuse me. 2 Corinthians 12. Something happened to him one day. And we'll go into when that day was. But he was caught up in a vision and he went up to paradise. Notice it doesn't say he went down to paradise. Jesus died on the cross and said, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He said the sign is that Jesus will be three days and three days, nights in the heart of the earth. So paradise, Jesus went to paradise, down. Then he came up and led captivity captive. Well, Paul, which is way out here, after Jesus died, after all this took place, was in a vision. He saw something. He was caught up to what the Bible calls the third heaven. And he calls it paradise. Why? Because paradise is up here. And that's where Paul went. He went up to where paradise is now. So let's begin in verse 2. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Well, what was it? I guess in the vision his soul went up. And his body was still on earth. How that he was caught up into paradise. Well, that's this. That's heaven. 
the third heaven. So paradise is no longer down here, Abraham's bosom. Captivity has been led captive, taken up, and paradise is now heaven. And heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for man to utter. So without a doubt, this verse is teaching that paradise is here now. And all those Old Testament saints are now in heaven with Jesus. And those who die today, over here after Jesus died, those of us who die, we go to heaven. We don't go down here like they did back then. We go to heaven. And we will look at that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verses 6 through 8. Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. A present with the Lord. So this body here dies. When that body dies, if you're a Christian, this soul inside goes directly to the Lord, to heaven. So when you die as a lost person, that's where you go, hell. But if you're saved in the New Testament today, and you were to die now, as a saved person, you'll go immediately to heaven because absent from the body is to be present in your soul with the Lord. What a blessing. That's what the Bible teaches. So what about those people in hell? What happens to them? Where do they end up? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Where do the dead go? That's a good sermon. It's a good, good question. And the answer was easy to find in the scriptures. It's not that hard to see. Heaven or hell? Smoking or non-smoking? Where will you spend eternity? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, if you end up going to hell, i got bad news for you. You ain't never getting out. One time, God will take you and put you before what's called the judgment, the great white throne of judgment. That's over here at the end of the church age. Well, Jesus comes back in Armageddon down here, and then he rules and reigns for a thousand years. And after that, he destroys the world and makes a new heaven and a new earth. He takes all these people out of hell. He takes them up before his throne. He shows them their sin. He shows them what they've done wrong. And he says, now, guess where you're going? You're going to the lake of fire. And so once they get out of hell, and they're judged for their sins, there's no chance to be saved then. God's just showing them, hey, this is for you that didn't know what the Bible said. Now go to the lake of fire, and they'll burn for all eternity. The Bible says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. In the, in the Greek language there, that word worm is a red maggot. It's almost like a person who rejected Jesus Christ. Their soul over, over eternity, over time, eventually just changes into like the shape of a red worm. And hell is just full of a bunch of worms crawling all over each other, burning in fire and flames. What a horrible place to go. What a horrible place to go. And it's not God's fault. People go to hell because of their sins and because they reject Jesus Christ. They can't say, it's all your fault, God, that I'm here. No, it's their fault for rejecting Jesus Christ as their Savior. Revelation chapter 1, 21 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So after this, it becomes a new heaven and a new earth, and God makes all things new. Let's go to Proverbs 15, 24. And as you're turning, let me ask you this question. Are you saved? Are you saved? This isn't a joke. This isn't something that, oh, that's a really interesting religious belief you have. And uh, I'll just listen to your religious belief because I like to study religions. And that's interesting, man. This is real. This is something that will last for all eternity. One of two places. Proverbs 15, 24 says, The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. So the way of life, that's eternal life. See, that's what God offers, is eternal life. And if you want to be saved, you need eternal life. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. And it says life, eternal life is above, but what does it say? That he may depart from hell beneath. Hell is down here. 
The Bible mentions the word hell many times. There are people that don't believe in hell. Well, that doesn't matter. There's people that don't believe in God. That doesn't matter. He still exists. I don't believe in hell, you say. That doesn't matter. It still exists. But just because you don't believe in something and it's real, doesn't mean you don't believe in it, doesn't mean it's not real. So, how do you go to heaven? That's the final question, and then we'll pause. How do you go to heaven? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 tell us how to get to heaven so we don't have to go to hell. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. We touched on some of that today. We talked about Jesus on the cross. He died. In three days and three nights, he was in the heart of the earth. He was buried. But yet his soul came down here. And why did Jesus rise again? Well, he rose again and he took these out here, up here to heaven with him. That's called the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what we didn't mention was why he died. For our sins. Sin is the reason we die. So Jesus came and died for our sins, and now he offers us what Adam and Eve had in the garden before they fell. This. Life. Eternal life. Spiritual life for all eternity. How do you get this eternal life? How do you go to heaven? It's by faith. It's by believing. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse... 8 pretty much contains the entire gospel in one verse. It says, For Christ, which is Jesus, 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus Christ died, the just for the unjust. Who's the just? Jesus. Who's the unjust? You. You're the unjust. And until you see yourself as a sinner deserving hell and come to Jesus Christ and trust what he's done for you, you'll never be saved. But if you accept Jesus as your Savior by trusting in his shed blood, what he did for you on the cross, his death, burial, resurrection, then you can be saved. And then you'll receive the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Ephesians 1.13 is very clear about that. I'll read it real quick. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Well, you've heard the gospel just now. In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when you believe the gospel and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And when you die, you go to heaven with Him. Why will you die? Because of sin. Either you believe this message, or you don't. I tried to make it as plain and simple as possible. Where do the dead go? One of two places. Either heaven or hell. If you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, and you ought to thank God that you don't have to go to hell. But if you're lost, you need to come to God. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please Him. You must come by faith to Jesus Christ and trust Him as your Savior. I hope today be the day that you come to Jesus. Please trust Him as your Savior. I don't want to see you go to hell. Matter of fact, God doesn't want to see you go to hell. Look at this. I'm going to close with this verse. I believe it's in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3.9 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, that's hell, and have everlasting life, that's heaven. It says God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God loved you so much, He'd rather die than see you go to hell. Think about that for a second. He loved you so much that He would rather die than see you go to hell. And that's exactly what He did. Now, how much do you love Him? 
How much do you care about hell and your soul? He loved your soul so much he died for it. Do you care enough about your soul to trust him so it doesn't go to hell? All Jesus did is, is for naught unless you accept it and trust it. Because otherwise you'll pay for your own sins in hell for all eternity. Why reject God when he paid for your sins for you on the cross? Thank you for watching. Please get saved if you're lost. And if you are saved, tell other people the gospel. Take them to 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Show them the truth of salvation. I appreciate you watching. And remember, it's all about, oh, wrong side, it's all about Jesus Christ, what he's done. That's how we're saved, what he did, not what we do. Thank you. Have a good day.